We need, we need shared secret keys for symmetric key encryption to work. We want to get one secret key to another person secretly. Well, how do we get one key to another person? Encrypt that key, but what key do we use to encrypt that key? So in fact, if it's a password, how do we get that across the other person? So if we want to share symmetric key, symmetric keys with someone else, then if we want to use symmetric key encryption to encrypt that key, then we need some master key. And in fact, we're going to have to revert back to manual delivery some stage. That is, at some point, if two users want to share a key, they need to exchange something manually with each other, not across a network, not across a public network, or with some third party. The third party is more useful in large networks because the users can contact that third party who, and they may trust that third party. So what we want to do now is see how we can use this third party, in this case it's called a key distribution center, which is trusted by all the users, to get a key from one user to another user. So imagine I'm the third party, you're the users, you all trust me, so if I give you something, uh, or if you come to me and I give you a key, then you trust that that is the correct key. And then you want to commu commu communicate with one of the other students. How do we do that? We'll use two different types of keys. That is, we'll each user will exchange a master key with me, the third party. So I will know the master, I will know your master, you will know your master you will not tell anyone else except the trusted third party. And once we exchange master keys, so I have gone to every user and got their master key yeah. and do that with every user. Now when two users want to communicate, we will use that master, master key to encrypt other keys. Session keys so that two users can exchange a session key to communicate where that session key is encrypted with a master key. And we'll see how that's performed in a moment with a master key. So the idea is to use two different types of keys. One, this master key which is used just for some communications, like exchanging keys. The session key is used for all data communications. You want to make a voice call to someone, you want to encrypt that voice call, you'll use a session key. You want to get a new session key, you may encrypt that new session key using a master key. The idea of using different keys is a, a, a one benefit is a, a commonly used security principle is change your keys often. That is, give the attacker less chance of discovering your key by using a new key. So a common approach is that you have one master key, you do not use it for many communications. You use your session key to encrypt your data, but you continually change your session key every so often. We'll talk about later how often. Encrypt our data with session keys, encrypt our session keys with master keys. Master keys are obtained using some manual delivery, using some non-cryptographic protection. That is, if you want to get a master key, maybe you have to come to my office and get it. Whereas session keys are obtained by encrypting them with master keys. Data is obtained by encrypting them with session keys. Let's look at an example of how we can distribute shared secret keys using a trusted third party. <coughs> we have three entities. The Key Distribution Center, KDC, both users and two users, A and B, a and B want to communicate. In fact, A wants to communicate with B. A wants to initiate some communications with user B, the responder. So the objective is that both A and B know a shared secret key. Once they know that shared secret key and they trust it, then they can encrypt their data when they communicate using that shared secret key. And it will be a shared secret session key that they'll exchange. 
The assumptions before we start, we see we have a number of steps of this protocol for exchanging keys. The assumptions are is that A trusts the KDC and B trusts the KDC. And in that, before, and the other assumption before these steps take place is that the KDC and A have exchanged master keys. And they, that is indicated as KA. You don't have to write it. The master keys KA and K, KA and KB. I'll write it on the board. So the assumption is at the start that user A has gone to the KDC and said, please give me a master key. The master key is KA. So both the KDC and user A know this master key. It's a shared secret key. And similar, user B has done that as well. So sometime in the past before this happens, both users have obtained a master key, KA and KB. KDC knows both of those keys. A does not know B's master key and never should. So now given that, A and B want to exchange a shared session key, KS. Session key between A and B is KS. The two users, A and B, are identified by two values, IDA and IDB. So some ident identification. If they are people, their names, their passport numbers, whatever. If they are computers, then something that identifies those computers uniquely in the system. So the first step, again, A wants to communicate with B secretly. So they need to exchange a session key. A contacts the KDC. That's step one. Sends a message to the KDC where the main contents of that message are the identity of A, who's initiating the contact, the identity of B, who A wants to con communicate with, and some value N1, which is a nonce value. So the first two values is user A saying to the KDC, I am user A, and I want to communicate with user B. Please give us a session key. That's what's going to happen in the next steps. Nonce value, N1, we'll see some other nonce values. For example, a timestamp, a counter, or a random value. N1 may be the current time, or some counter. If we do this over multiple times, let's set it initially to zero. The next time, if we do this again, set it to one, and so on. Or maybe a random value. Just choose a random value of some length. Importantly, the nonce value, N1, the next time we do this, these set of steps, it should be different. So we can distinguish that it's not a replay of an old message. We'll see that there's another, another nonce value, N2, as well, that has the same characteristics. And it should be difficult for the attacker to guess. So normally a random number is used. We'll see especially for the nonce 2, that's important. So first step, A essentially requests a session key from the KDC, a session key to communicate with B. The KDC responds with this long message. Let's look at the details. The KDC responds with a message which everything is in, uh, not everything, two parts. There are two parts. We see the first ciphertext uh, concatenated with the second piece of ciphertext. So two parts there. Look, look at the first part first. 
it's the value of the session key KS so the KDC chooses a session key some random key say some 128 bit key that A and B are about to use KDC chooses it KS and combines that with the identity of A B and the original nonce value N1 so the first message sent from A to KDC contained ID A, ID B, N1. The response contains those three, three values plus the session key. And all of that, those four values, are encrypted with the master key of user A. KDC knows the master key for user A. User A knows the master key. So if KDC encrypts this message, with KA, user A will be able to decrypt it. It's a shared secret key. So that's the first part of the response from the KDC. It's basically telling the user A, here is your session key. So that some malicious user that intercepts this message doesn't see the session key, it's encrypted. Because if there's a malicious user that intercepts message 2, if we did not, if we didn't encrypt with KA, the malicious user would see the session key and our key is no longer secret. We need to keep the, the keys secret. So we encrypt with the master key KA. What is KS? KS is the session key. Session key, master key, session key, and ID? KA, so we have three keys in this system. All shared secret keys, all for symmetric key crypt cryptography master keys A and B and session key KS. The master keys are just used for obtaining the session key. The session key will be used for encrypting data between A and B. Sorry, go back. So KDC selects the session key KS, encrypts it with the master key KA, sends it to user A. User A when they receive that part will decrypt focusing just on the first part, they'll decrypt, they'll check that this is a response to their request. User A sent a request, ID A, ID B, nonce N1. The response comes back, user A, ID B, nonce N1. If the two nonce values are the same, then it knows that this is a response to that previous request I just sent. And of course it's all encrypted so that the attacker, an attacker, cannot see that session key because it's encrypted with KA. What is the ID? ID is an identity. Identity. An identity, something that identifies the, the user. So if we're talking about a computer, maybe it identifies by IP address, port number, some unique identifier inside a system. And, and N, N1? N is a nonce, as you see on the next slide. Some of them are defined. Let's assume it's a random value for now. N1, user A chose a random value, N1, sent it to KDC. When the KDC, KDC sends back a reply, it includes that same random value, N1, but it's all encrypted with KA. The second part of the message, which is concatenated here, is the same session key KS and the identity of A, the initiator, and it's encrypted with KB, the master key for B. The idea here is that KDC is going to send one message back to A. A will receive the session key because they'll decrypt this first part using KA. The second part, A will send unchanged onto B. This way it uh, saves the key KDC sending a, a separate message to user B. The message is sent from A. So first part is sending the session key from KDC to A. The second part of this message is going to be sent from A to B, which also contains the same session key. So after step two, a decrypts the first part, finds the session key, 
checks all the values are the same as before. They should be so that we know that this is a response to that initial request. It's not some replay of a, uh, some old response using a different nonce value. And takes the second part, decrypts the second part, does it? Do they decrypt the second part? Check. Two parts in message two. The second part, is it decrypted by A? No. no. Not decrypted. The second part is encrypted using the master key for B, KB. Even though it's sent to A, A cannot decrypt this part. They don't need to. A has the session key in the first part. A just takes the second part and sends as is onto B. saves us one message. A wants to communicate with B. A needs to initiate this communication with B somehow. That is, they need to send a message saying, I want to communicate with you. So A is going to send a message to B. So the alternative, like you said, KDC sends one message to A, sends another message to B. But what might happen is that B receives this message and A has never contacted it. B will be confused. Why, why do I need this? Uh, this works just as well. That is, send everything to A. A needs to send something to B eventually, saying, I want to communicate with you. So include this encrypted session key with it. So it saves that message from KDC to B in that case. B no this is known, this information. Before these steps, it's assumed that KDC knows a, KA and KB, and of course A knows KA and B knows KB. That's the assumption at the start. That is, they've exchanged master keys somehow. We don't say how, but they have. This can be all done over a network. KDC could be in Thailand, user A could be in Australia, user B could be in Germany. Okay? Because we're encrypting the information that needs to be kept secure, we can send it across a public network, the internet, for example. Whereas the master keys, how did we exchange them? Well, we'd like to use some secure channel to do that. Maybe we had to go to some organization to get that master key. Physically go there, show evidence of your identity and so on. After step two, user A decrypts and finds the session key. So KDC, KDC chose the session key, sends it to A. When A decrypts the second message, they find, they know the session key, KS. They send the second part on to B saying one thing, I want to communicate with you. And here's the part that the KDC sent to me. That's message three. User B decrypts that. B has the master key KB, decrypts that, and B knows that, now knows the session key KS, and knows that it came from the right person. So when B decrypts, they learn KS, the session key, because we need that for the data communications. And because the identity of A was encrypted and it was created by the KDC, then B knows that this session key is for communications with user A, not someone else. So if someone else sent them this message, maybe copied this message and replayed it at a later stage, user C sent them this message, when B decrypted it and saw that the identity of identity was for A, they would know something's gone wrong. So because it has the identity of A in here, which was put in there by the KDC, and B trusts the KDC. So it knows this session key is for communicating with A. We're finished now. Both A and B have a shared session key, and that's been exchanged secretly. So we've achieved our objective. Everyone, two users know the shared secret, secret key KS. 
we'll see the next two steps uh, some some extra tasks that we want to perform like a company like we can give the key for you're, you're too far ahead of us you, you like a company like Verisign that gives certificates and so on for web servers we'll cover that if we get a chance at the end of today certificates use public key cryptography we're talking about symmetric key cryptography that is our objective in this case is exchange shared secret keys for symmetric key cryptography and to do that we're using symmetric key cryptography to encrypt those session keys that is this E is encryption using a symmetric key algorithm like triple S. no public key cryptography yet not in this example so we have exchanged session keys the last two steps, four and five, uh, it says here part of authentication, just to check that it's not someone replaying this message pretending to be user A. What happens, let's go through the steps and then see how they help us. B now uses the session key KS, chooses a new nonce value, N2, let's say a random number, encrypts that nonce value N2 with the session key, sends it back to A. If A can decrypt, they should be able to decrypt because they have KS, then they take the received nonce value and send back some operation or function on that nonce value also encrypted with KS to B. Receive and send, do not decrypt. So this part here part yeah, cannot decrypt because it's encrypted with KB. A doesn't have KB, therefore cannot decrypt. It's a sequence of bits. Just send that message. Yep. Encrypt ciphertext to B. Yes, so we know the structure of that message. That Let's say we know it's the last 256 bytes. Then we just take those 256 bytes, send them as is. We don't change anything. We cannot change anything. If we try to change something, then uh, it will not be able to de be decrypted correctly. Last two steps is to prevent someone intercepting and, and replaying message. So B sends some random value, some nonce value, encrypted with a session key. A decrypts with a session key and sends a function of that nonce value. For example, increment by one. And when B receives this and decrypts and sees that the nonce value they received is incremented by one, they know that the person they're communicating is with is A. Because only A could have decrypted this value. Because only A has the session key. If there was a malicious user that intercepted message 4 trying to pretend to be some user A a malicious user inside in between the two intercepts message 4 they cannot discover the nonce value and because B is expecting this fifth message if they don't receive the fifth message and they don't receive the correct fifth message they will assume something's gone wrong so they may have some timeout if they haven't received a message within 10 seconds assume the, the exchange has gone wrong and do not trust anything from now on because if an attacker intercepts message 4 they cannot discover the nonce value therefore they cannot send message 5 back because what do they send back if they don't know the nonce value if they try to send something B will detect that similar if an attacker uh, replays message 3 Uh, what have we got? Replay of message three. If the attacker replays message three, the exact same copy, they don't know the session key, B sends message four. If the attacker intercepts that, they still cannot send back message five correctly and therefore a replay of message 3 would be detected by user B. 
So these last two steps of this final exchange of a nonce value is to prevent replay attacks, attackers trying to masquerade as other users. Because if the five steps don't complete successfully, neither user will trust those values at which we exchange. And we'll have to start again or report some problem. So there's one example of how do we use a trusted third party, a key distribution center, to exchange shared secret keys, a session key, KS. And works OK. So this second part of message two, why do we send it? Remember the goal is to get KS to both A and B. The, the approach is that KDC chooses KS. The first part, we encrypt KS plus some other information with a master key of A, send it to A. A will decrypt and know the session key. Good. The second part, we encrypt the same KS with a master key of B. We want to send it to, to B. That's the idea. So that B will decrypt and know the session key. Just for some uh, efficiency, we send it via A. Because A has to send a message to B anyway to initiate the communications. So in the same message, we include the encrypted session key to be forwarded on by the initiator A to B. We don't want anyone to modify this message. Uh, every user has their own master key shared with the uh, KDC. If, if this was encrypted with key KA, then how could initiator A send it encrypted to B? Because B doesn't know the session key yet. A doesn't know B's master key, so A cannot encrypt it and send it secretly to B. So in fact, the KDC encrypts it for A. A just forwards it on as is. It's just uh, relayed through A. It's designed so that if an attacker intercepts these messages, they cannot discover the session key and cannot perform attacks like replaying messages to confuse the other entities into thinking that they have a key which is in fact some invalid key or some pass key that shouldn't be used. So we distribute the key and then do some final authentication checks. What's the problem of using a key distribution center? One is that we need to trust that KDC. If I'm the central third party and I ask all of your users to exchange a master key with me, then you need to trust me because the KDC has all the master keys of all the users. If the KDC is compromised in any way, the entire system fails because all the master keys are released. So we need to make sure the KDC is trusted and secure. And in trusted, in this approach, two users, when they send data with each, between each other using the shared session key, the KDC can see that data. So user A, when they encrypt information with KS and later send data to B, if the KDC intercepts that, they can decrypt it because the KDC has the session key. They created the session key. So we must trust the KDC in this case. Now you may trust me, but in some cases if this is companies that uh, want to communicate, then who do they trust as the trusted third party? The government? Well, some governments you would not trust. Some you need to trust them that you don't want them. If, 
that it's okay that they see communications between two companies, for example, you need to make sure that that KDC cannot be compromised in any way. That is, they need to be uh, a secure facility, for example. So that's the problem or a limitation of using a KDC. Another problem is if we just have one KDC, then A, that KDC could be overloaded because every user needs to contact that KDC and it could be hard to exchange master keys. So in practice you can have a hierarchy of KDCs. There's one KDC for SIT, uh, for, for our campus, and there's another one for SIT, the Rungsit campus, and they are used to, for all computers to communicate securely inside this campus, they get a session key from the KDC inside this campus and similar at the Rungsit campus. And if you want to communicate with someone between campuses, then those two KDCs can communicate with each other via a hierarchy of KDCs. That makes it more practical in that you don't have millions of users contacting just one KDC. You can distribute the load amongst several KDCs. And it limits the damage if one KDC is compromised. If someone compromises the KDC at this campus, then they don't necessarily have all the information stored at the KDC at the other campus. So it limits the damage in that case. So we can use KDCs or, the, or this approach for computer-based encryption. That is, all your computers on the network must encrypt everything that they send to each other. And we want to automatically obtain keys. We don't want users to be involved then when we set up the computers, we must give them a master key. That master key must have come from the KDC and be stored at the KDC. And now, when two computers on the network want to communicate, they just use some protocol that implements this. Computer A contacts the KDC. KDC sends a session key, three, four, five, and then those two computers can securely communicate encrypting data with a session key. So it can be automated in a, in a network. How, sh how long should the session key be used for? What's the session key lifetime? Shorter lifetime, more secure, but increases the overhead. That is, let's say we use a session key for five minutes. Every five minutes, if A and B want to keep communicating, they need to do this process. Contact the KDC, KDC generates a new session key, they use that new session key to send and encry encrypt their data. By changing the session key we get more security, but the more times we change, the more times we need to send these packets to set up the session key. So more overhead in the network. So there's a trade-off there. Some examples, if you're using a connection-oriented protocol like TCP, it may be every time you set up a connection. Or after some fixed period of time if you don't create connections. After sending a million packets, encrypted with one session key, change to a new session key by repeating that proce procedure. If you don't trust me, use a decentralized approach. Okay, here's an example of an approach which doesn't rely on a KDC. But the problem with this approach is that each system must, manu must manually exchange some master key with the other systems. Both A and B need to know a master key in this case. And we see what happens. A wants to communicate with B, they send some initial message saying I am A, here's some nonce value. What B does is using the master key KM, chooses a session key and responds with the identity of A and B, some operation on the nonce value and some new nonce value. If 
both A and B have the master key KM, A can decrypt this, discover the session key, and does some final confirmation to confirm that this is not someone replaying a message, some intercepting malicious user. By encrypting using that session key, some operation on the second nonce value. This approach doesn't need a KDC, but it does need both users to know a shared master key, KM. That's not so good because you need to manually distribute that master key. So if you have many users, it becomes too hard to manually distribute master keys. If you have a, a few users, that may be okay. Yep. Okay. In the previous approach, we had a KDC and we trusted that KDC. Let's say we want to do the same thing, but we don't trust the KDC. So the setup, KFC would be good. In the, in the first approach, where we used a KDC, in the diagram, these were the known values before we started the exchange. That is, we knew or that we had manually exchanged a master key between A and the KDC, and we had manually exchanged a master key between B and the KDC. That was the assumption in the first approach. Every user exchanges a master key with a KDC. A thousand users, a thousand manual exchanges, one per user, all to the KDC. And we learnt the session key. If we don't want to use the KDC, then we can try this approach. But the, start, the starting assumption is that both A and B know the master key, KM. If there's another set of users, or if, if there's another user, C, then the assumption in such a network is A and B have exchanged a master key manually, B and C have exchanged a master key manually separately, and A and C have exchanged a master key manually. So if there are 1,000 users, how many master keys do we need to exchange in this approach before we do this? 1,000 users. We need to exchange between e every pair of entities. In the first approach, In the first approach, every user must manually exchange a master key with a KDC. So there are n exchanges that are manually performed. That takes effort. We need some extra way to do that. In the second approach, every user must exchange with every other user a master key, a separate master key. We have n by n minus 1 divided by 2 pairs. That is A with B, B with C, C with A. And if we have more users, that grows. So in this approach, we need many more master keys manually exchanged before it will work. And that's the, the limitation, really. And how does it work? Assuming A and B know KM, a says, I want to communicate with B. B selects a session key, KS, responds, including KS, so B now knows KS, responds, including the identity of A, who contacted it, the identity of B, some operational function on the nonce value that A selected. If N1 was a random number, increment that random number by 1. 
and choose a new random number, N2, a new nonce value. Encrypt all of that with a master key. Only B has that master key. Only B and A have that master key. B encrypts with the master key. A decrypts with the master key when they receive it. When A decrypts, they know the session key. They know that it came from the right responder. This nonce value is one more than the one that A sends, so they know it's a response to that initial message. It contains this second random number, N2, so they do some final response saying some operation on N2, increment it by one, for example, and encrypt with the session key. Only A and B should know the session key. A, B chose the session key, encrypted it with a master key and sent it to A. A decrypted, found the session key and sent some increment of the nonce value to B. Yes, yes, this is the, the master keys. Does it assume that they already have the master keys or not? Uh, for this to work, it assumes all the users have exchanged master keys, yes. So this uh, calculate before uh, exchanging the master keys? Uh, no, you, you have, we have 20 users in this network, okay? If we want to use this approach, then every user, so you go to another person, you exchange a master key. You go to the next person, exchange a separate master key. So you will go around to 19 other people and say, let's use this master key. So it's like master key for each connection? A master key for each pair of users, yes. Because, because note that we encrypt the session key using that master key. Let's say you and I use one master key and I use the same master key with another user. We want to communicate, I encrypt a session key with our master key this other user can decrypt that and find the session key. I don't want him to see my data. The session key should be between a pair of users and therefore a master key must be between a pair of users. No. Uh, master key is used just for distributing the session key. Now the benefit here is that we use the master key just once. Both are symmetric keys. Okay, let's go back to the benefit of this approach. Remember, we don't want to use keys very often. I want to send a million packets from A to B. Okay, I'm going to encrypt every packet with a key. Option one, I could encrypt every packet with my master key that I've shared with B. That would work. Do not do this. Simply because I've previously exchanged a master key with B, every packet I send, I encrypt with my master key. B can decrypt. That's okay. The problem is that I'm using that master key many times. What if I want to change the key because I, uh, something's gone wrong or I don't want an attacker to have a chance to try to detect and find out what the key is? The, a security principle with keys is do not use it for too long. Change your keys. If I encrypt my data with a master key, to change that master key sometime later, we need to go, this, go through this whole step of manual exchange of keys. That's very time consuming. So what we do, exchange master keys in the manual approach. It takes time, but we do it just once. When I want to encrypt data from A to B, I encrypt with a session key. How do I get the session key? It's encrypted with the master key. So I only use the master key one time every time I want to get a new session key. I have a policy to in use a key just 1,000 times and then I must change it. That's my security policy. I don't want to reuse it all the time. So I've got a million packets to send. The advantage of this approach is what we do 
We exchange a master key manually, take some time, do it once, encrypt the first 1,000 packets, steps, okay? Get a session key. We've encrypted that session key once with the master key. We've used the master key just one time. Now, of the first 1,000 packets, I encrypt with the session key. So I've used the one, that session key 1,000 times. Time to change. Perform this three steps again. Automatically across a network. So I use the master key one more time. I've now used it twice. Use a new session key, encrypt the next 1,000 packets, and keep going. I can change the session key very easily in this case. So I don't use the master key very often, and I can continually change my session key so that I don't use any key too often. Because if I keep using the same key too often, then it increases the chance of the attacker to find the key. So we want to avoid that. In this case, it would be used 1,000 times. That is, if we have a million packets and we want to encrypt only 1,000 packets with a session key, I encrypt the first 1,000 packets with a session key, repeat this process, encrypting one packet with the master key, packet two there. Let's say use uh, 1, 000, uh, master key for 1,000 times, right? Yep. So then we still, do we need to get another key? You could potentially, if you want to change that, you could do that, but you have to go through the manual steps. But you don't have to do it as often as if you just encrypted all the packets with a master key. If you encrypted all the packets with a master key, you'd need to change with manual delivery the master key 1,000 times. That's very inefficient. So it's about manual delivery of keys. Master keys must be manually delivered versus automatic delivery, where we use the protocol to automatically deliver a key, in this case a session key, between users. So it's a trade-off there. Is we want to do not reuse a key too often, but we don't want to have manual delivery of keys too often either, because that's a large overhead. It may mean someone going to some building, proving their identity, uh, for example, there's a KDC in this campus. It means every student to get a new master key must come to my office, show their ID card. We create a master key. You go back to your computer, configure it. That takes time. This takes three packets. It just can be automatically done between the computers. So two approaches. One use a KDC, one do it fully distributed, do not rely on a KDC. Any questions? Any more questions? We want to distribute shared secret keys using symmetric key cryptography. We've seen two examples. Another case. distribute shared secret keys using asymmetric cryptography, using public and private keys. That is, two users want to exchange a triple desk key. We're going to use public key cryptography to do that exchange. In the previous cases, we used symmetric key cryptography to do that exchange. Here's an alternative. Why would we want to do this, or what's one of the issues here? Normally we encrypt data using symmetric key crypt cryptography because asymmetric encryption is too slow. To encrypt a large amount of data, it takes too much time. Where do we use asymmetric encryption or public key cryptography? Well, one thing is to exchange secret keys. That is, I want to encrypt some data, use public key cryptography to exchange a secret key and then use that secret key to encrypt the data. That combines the advantages of both approaches. We'll go through three different examples of 
how we can exchange a share, shared secret key using public key cryptography. Actually, the first two will go in some depth. The, the third case is, I don't think we have a slide on it. I think we can combine public key distribution with a KDC. Maybe there's say something about it after the first two. First one. A simple way to distribute secret keys using public key cryptography. Two users, A and B, they both have public and private keys. A, they want to know a session key, KS. A sends its public key and its identity to B, saying, I am A, here is my public key, I want to communicate with you. B uses that public key, selects a session key, KS, encrypts that with a public key, sends back the ciphertext to A. A can decrypt, because A has the corresponding private key. A decrypts, finds the session key, we've completed. Let's see how that works and how it doesn't work. So what's known in this case before this exchange, A has a public and private key pair, B has its own public and private key pair. They don't know each other's public key, they don't need to in this. Very simple. A computer starts, generates its own public private key, B in fact doesn't need a public and private key, so it's not even needed here. A simply sends the public key to B, including A's identity. B uses that public key to encrypt some chosen se session key, a shared secret key, and therefore A can decrypt. Because A has the corresponding private key, A learns the secret key, and now they both know KS, and they can encrypt their data from now on. But as you see, it's a man in the middle attack is possible in this case, not a meat in the middle with triple deaths, this is a man in the middle. Pretend to be A. Yeah. Try it. Okay. You work out the answer. Work out how the man in the man in the middle attack works on that scheme. Draw the picture and put a man in the middle of A and B, a malicious man, and see what he can do to find the session key such that A and B do not, do not know that they're in the middle. So now you have a malicious user C or M or whoever you like to call them in the middle of A and B. See how they can intercept the messages and do something malicious so that they find the session key. And importantly, so that A and B don't know that they have the session key.
Yep. Assuming that A and B follow these steps, see what happens when you put a man in the middle. See what they can do. So A sends the first message, message one. So draw on your picture A sending message one but intercepted by C. What does C do next? Try. That's it. So it's okay. <laughs>
Let's go through, and I think most people on track. A does the normal procedure. The idea is that C will be a man in the middle, find the session key, and when A and B keep communicating with this session key, C will be able to decrypt all their data. That's the idea, that A and B don't know that C has got the session key. So how does it work? A sends a message to B, including A's public key and its identity, saying A wants to communicate with B. But C intercepts and changes that message. It modifies. C has its own pair of public-private key, modifies the key. So it's a, if I'm A, I send an e email to you, and I include it in the email, this is the public key of Steve, and it's got my signature at the end, my name, Stephen Gordon, at the end, then before it gets to you, C intercepts that email, modifies the public key in the message. That is, they just change the public key from PUA to PUC, the public key of C. Keep everything else the same. Lowercase a. They, so you, when you receive this message, you think it came from A. You think you're about to communicate with A using this public key. B chooses KS. With the public key of A that B thinks it has, it encrypts KS, but it's not in fact the public key of A, it's the public key of C. C receives that, C has the corresponding private key, decrypts, finds KS, and now encrypts using the public key of A. the same value of KS. A receives this, decrypts with the private key of A, finds KS. A and B are happy. A and B have exchanged session keys, KS. Now A starts encrypting data, sending it to B. All C does is intercepts every packet, decrypts, forwards are on encrypted to, the, to B. They don't, A and B don't know that C is in the man in the middle decrypting that data. So that's the problem with this very simple uh, key distribution scheme. We need some way to verify that a public key actually belongs to that user. Our problem here is that when B receives this, it receives a public key, but it doesn't belong to user A, it belongs to someone else. We need some other way to verify that. So it turns out that this scheme is only useful if an, an attacker cannot modify or insert messages. If there's no way for the attacker to intercept and change messages, then this scheme's okay. But if the attacker can get between the source and destination and modify messages, it's of no use, it's not secure. Maybe, for example, across a link, uh, 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 optical fiber link from one campus to another. Assuming we trust the telecommunications company, this approach may be okay. Because it's almost impossible for the attacker to tap into that link and modify messages. Okay, so there are some cases where it's okay. Uh, a better approach. This approach involves the entities knowing each other's public key. The previous approach, they didn't know the public key of the other user. And that's what caused the problem, because they used the wrong key. Here, assuming A knows the public key of B, and it is indeed the public key of B, encrypt some nonce value, N1, and the identity of A, saying, I want to communicate with B, only B can decrypt. Responds, saying, 
OK, confirming or acknowledging that this is, is a response using the same N1 and choosing a new nonce value, and then public key using the public key of B, encrypt this nonce 2 again. So these first three steps are authenticating, making sure that it's the right user we're communicating with. Because if someone, someone else sent message 1, malicious user C sent message 1, then B would be able to decrypt, would take the nonce value N1, B would reply encrypting with a public key of A, C would not be able to decrypt and reply with message 3. So these first three steps prevent the approach of the attacker, for example, sending message 1, pretending to be A, using B's public key. If they do that, B will respond, including the nonce 2, C will not be able to decrypt message 2. If it's encrypted with the public key of A, C will not be able to decrypt it, and C will not be able to respond with message 3 in that case. So that's how we have uh, these three exchanges to make sure we're communicating with the right user. And the last one is where we send the session key. KS is encrypted with a private key. Oh, this is a signature here. KS is encrypted with a private key of A and the public key of B. So we in fact sign this message and encrypt it for confidentiality. The end result is both A and B know the session key KS and they know that it came from the right person, that it's shared between A and B, not someone pretending to be A and B or A or B. A good check for understanding is when you practice with a quiz, ask yourself what happens if an attacker intercepts message 2? What can they do? Can they decrypt it? Can they replay it? What happens if they replay it? Will it be detected by the other nodes the, from the other interactions? Because for this to be successful, we must complete all four messages. If something goes wrong along the way, then A and B will give up. They will not communicate using the session key. They will report an error or try again. Uh, the first three are confirming that we're using the right keys and not coming from someone else. So if, let's, let's give another example, if user A sends the first message, user B responds, if that response is intercepted by a malicious user, what can they do? If the malicious user intercepts message 2, they cannot decrypt. Therefore, they cannot find out N2. Therefore, they cannot respond with message 3. And then, therefore, B will discover something's gone wrong. Similar with message 1. If message 1 was sent or modified by, message, uh, by a malicious user C, then a and B would discover that because the subsequent messages would not be sent correctly. Uh, and again, what was your question? Sorry, it's getting late. Ah, why not send three and four together? Yes. Oh, you could. You could send them in one message, one packet, for example. But they're, two, they're performing two different things. Conceptually, message three is confirming that message 2 was received correctly. Message 4 is the next step. But you're right in that, in terms of network communications, they could be concatenated with each other. But two separate pieces of information. So, 
Uh, yeah, it's a handshake to confirm that we're communicating with the right people. It's a three-layer Yes, yeah, so in terms of a handshake, that's uh, the each next message is acknowledging or confirming that the previous one was received and sent by the right person. Yeah. It's acknowledging what happened. But from a security perspective, not just acknowledging that you received the packet from error control perspective. We can combine some of these approaches we've gone through. Symmetric, public, KDC can be combined with some of the previous approaches we've gone through. We want to get on in the last 15 minutes to certificates. One of the questions early on was, is that how we exchange with a web server or a company like Fort or VeriSign? When you access a secure website, how does that work? Well, in fact, we use public key encryption and we use public and private keys for dist or we distribute public keys. In the assignment, how did I distribute my public key? Uh, I, I published on my website. Uh, so what, that's one way to distribute public keys. So now we're moving, forget just for the next 15 minutes, forget about symmetric key encryption, sharing secret keys. How do we get someone else's public key in a secure manner? There's one way, just announce it. I'm in the room, I pick up a piece of paper and I read it out and you all write it down. Or I post it on my website or I put it in a newspaper. Inconvenient in some ways and insecure in some ways in that if I put it on my website, how, do you, how are you sure that it was not someone else with access to the IT server that put it on my website? Pretending to be Steve's public key but in fact Dr. Tanarak's public key. Okay? I know you better watch him sometimes. No, no. Uh, Yes, so you'll see some people will send their public key by email. But how do you know that someone hasn't intercepted that, met, that email, a man in the middle, and changed the public key? You don't. How would you know? So that relies on trust that there's no man in the middle that modifies that email. So how do we distribute public keys? Well, public keys can be public. It sounds easy. Just tell everyone. But man in the middle attacks and similar create problems. Public announcement, just tell everyone, put it on a website, a newspaper, whatever. Uh, we'll see a way to do that using some computer based directory rather than a newspaper or a website, and some variations and eventually lead to certificates, which is a common approach used now nowadays. So the issue is how are we sure that the public key of A actually belongs to A? and not someone pretending to be A. The public key received should belong to A, not C pretending to be A. That's the problem. Announcements, as we said, just post it somewhere that's public, uh, but we still have this problem of a man in the middle attack. Used if you know, like someone said, if you know the person, not from email, Okay, if I, if I print it out and put it in my office and you come into the office and you see it there, then you may trust that it came from me, not someone else. We could have some directory, some computer service that users publish their keys to that directory and other users obtain the key from the directory. So there's some special computer some server, all of the students publish their key on that server. When other users want to find the other student's key, they go to the server and get a request, uh, and make a request. Of course, the server must be secure because if some malicious user can change the keys on the server, then they can pretend to be someone else. A specific case of the publicly available directory is shown here, a, a protocol for doing it. We have this directory, it's called the public key authority. And we have our two users that want to communicate. 
the assumption here is that each user has securely security, that's a spelling mistake, securely published public key at authority, not security. That is, user A has gone to the authority and said, here's my public key. And user B has gone to the authority and said, here's my public key. The authority has stored those in some database. So that's the assumption before these steps happen. The, the objective here is that A and B learn each other's public key. So currently the authority has the public key of A and B. The end result is that B should have A's public key and A should have B's public key. And be sure that it's that person, that person's public key, not someone else's. Here are the steps. And there is a number, but some are similar. First step. User A wants to communicate with B, so they start this process. They send a message to the authority saying, a request, I want to request a public key of B. Although it's not shown here, the request would say whose public key they want. So the request would say, I'm user A and I want B's public key. The authority has B's public key stored in its database from the previous exchange. Public key authority responds, encrypting the public key of B and the request that was sent with the private key of the authority. What did it just do? What did the authority just do? In message two, what do we call that process? Encrypting with a private key is called, start, yeah, more specific, starts with S. <laughs> Signature, we sign the message. All right, normally when we sign, we'll include a hash, but only for performance reasons. We sign a message when we encrypt with a user's private key, it's signing the message, meaning this message definitely came from the authority. If it's encrypted with the private key of the authority, anyone can decrypt because everyone has the public key of the authority, but it confirms this message came from the authority. And if we trust the authority, then we believe the message because it's signed by the authority. Good exam question, isn't it? Now let's see. Let's So first, what is assumed before these six steps? What do we know? Both or all three entities have their own public-private key pair. A has P-U-A, P-R-A, so does B for B, and the authority has its own pair as well. Okay? They generate their own pairs. The two users, A and B, publish their public key to the directory somehow. If I'm running the directory server, or I'm the authority, then you give me your public key, you come to my office, I enter it into the database. Okay? So the authority has the public key of A and B. Also, when you came to me and gave me your public key, I, as the authority, gave you my public key. So 
A and B both know the public key of the authority. <coughs> the goal is that B knows A's public key and A knows B's public key. That's the end result, or it should be. So A requests the public key of B, authority sends back the public key of B as, well, as well as the request. T1 is a timestamp, again so that if sometime later another request comes, we can distinguish between new requests and replayed requests. And importantly, the public key authority signs that public key. And A can verify the signature. It's encrypted with the private key of the authority. A has the public key of the authority and therefore verifies this message came from the authority. It has not been modified. And since it contains the public key of B, it came from the authority. I trust the authority. I now know the public key of B, and I trust that key. If we had a man in the middle here who changed this message, it would not be verified. That is, if they change the contents, they cannot encrypt with the private key of the authority again. So a man in the middle of these two would not be able to do anything which would not go to undetected. So now A has the public key of B. That's the first half of the operation. Now B wants to learn the public key of A. B doesn't know anything about what's happening. A wants to initiate communications. Step two, a man in the middle can encrypt with the public key of the authority but that doesn't help the man in the middle because when A receives this, they will decrypt with the public key of the authority. They expect to receive a message encrypted with the private key of the authority, PR authority. If they receive something else, they'll try to decrypt with the public key of the authority. Uh, yeah. They all know this procedure. Because when I ask the company, the combination that I use the public key of that company to decrypt. So he use not the public key of the man in the middle. Uh, I send a request for a public key. I know I'm going to receive the public key in response, and I know it's going to be signed by the authority. Uh -huh. If it's encrypted with something else other than the private key of the authority, I won't trust it. So, I'm the authority, you send me a request, you want someone else's public key, I will sign the public key of that other person. By sign, I mean encrypt with my private key. And you can verify, so note the two operations, signing with a private key, verify with the corresponding public key. You will verify the message you received. Verify it came from me. You may be still thinking about websites and certificates, which is the next diagram, the next one. Still ahead. A has the public key of B. A tells B, I want to communicate with you. And it does that by encrypting with the public key of B, such that no one else can decrypt. No one has the private key of B except B. Step three triggers B to request A's public key. A has B's public key from step two. After step three, B repeats basically what A did. I, B asks the authority for A's public key. Step four, the request. The authority sends back the public key of A, but signed by the authority. And therefore, B verifies this message came from the authority. It must have. If it came from someone else, it would not verify correctly. So when B receives message five, B has the public key and knows that this came from the authority, trusts the authority, and therefore trusts the pub public key. They know it's A's. We're finished except for some final authentication in case message three is replayed.
A has B's public key from message two, B has A's public key from message five, six and seven are just some final acknowledgements this, in this handshake to make sure that one of these messages, such as message three, has not been replayed by someone else to confirm that uh, it is in fact A that sent that message originally, not someone replaying that message. Diffie-Hellman's another way. What does Diffie-Hellman do? Exchange secret keys. What are we doing here? Exchanging public keys. Different purpose. But Diffie-Hellman is a, an alternative for exchanging a secret, for sure. As, as we did in the previous topics on uh, the previous slides. Yep, that's another alternative. Yep. And there are other algorithms as well. The problem with this approach is that every time A and B want to communicate, A sends a message to the authority requesting the public key of the authority. Then three, and then B contacts the authority and gets the public key of A. So when two users want to communicate, they both contact the authority. That can create a, a performance problem with the authority. There's too many messages coming to the authority. Let's say we now have 1,000 users. There are, what, 500,000 pairs of users, about. That is, over some time, there may be 500,000 requests, or times two, a million requests coming to the authority every time they want a public key of someone else. It can overload the authority. Next week, we'll look at the alternative, which is what you use in websites and what web servers use, is digital certificates. In a small extension that improves on the performance and uses certificates, or what we call certificates, to provide exchange of public and private public keys. 